Meta programming in D, making programming fun again. Predator Maze for all of the demon you see in this presentation. D has a plethora of meta programming features, including static if, static void, templates, eponymous templates, mixins, green mixins, and template mixins, baits, compiler time function execution, user defined attributes, and likely more I cannot think of. D excels at writing code that can use other code. In this video, I'll try to cover most of D's compile time features while also providing example usages of them. Hopefully, this will allow you to see why D's metaprogramming is mostly unrivaled. Now, sometimes, sometimes you anger the template demon itself. And yes, this is a real example. We'll be starting off with talking about sdg.com.2. This is a very commonly used function used to confer types into other types. In some languages, the mere thought of automatically formatting things like structs and arrays strings is nightmare fuel. This is because you usually need to have boilerplate or just do things manually, which is tedious and book prime. In D, however, actually very straightforward. So let's use stt.com for two to learn more about D's metaprogramming. Before we do that though, we need to learn about a few components in D that will allow us to write our own version of std.com for two. First of all, we have uniform function call syntax, otherwise known as UFCS. It allows us to call freestanding functions as if they were member functions. As you can see on the left, we have the normal way where we nest successive function calls together in order to create our pipeline. We then have the D way where we can chain function calls together using UFCS, which looks a lot more natural, easy to read, and most importantly, easy to make changes to. Both pieces of code are equivalent to function, but not in maintainability. Just to make sure it's clear, UFCS allows one to write freestanding function with the parameters a, b, c as parameter a dot freestanding function the parameters b and c. We take the freestanding function func and apply it to a as if it was a member function of a. It makes a lot more sense when you do it yourself. The next component is templated functions. A templated function can take any number of template parameters. Template parameters are defined using a second set of parentheses. If you look on the left, we have two sets of parentheses on our functions. First set offers template parameters, second set offers runtime parameters. Template parameters can either be a type parameter or an alias parameter. There are also other parameters, but I'm not going to cover those. Alias parameters are more flexible as they support a wider variety of values. You can see on the left that the F2 function can support a lot of interesting things being passed into it. Honestly, you can pass pretty much anything into an alias parameter, including member symbols, modules, values, etc. We still need to be able to filter which code is run based on the template parameter though. So that brings us to component number two. Template specializations. You can attach constraints onto parameters or onto the entire function, control which specialization the compiler will choose for any set of template parameters. For the first specialization, we use the is implicitly convertible constraint directly on the T parameter. So it can only be used with strings. For the second specialization, we use a function constraint to ensure that T is only numeric type using the is numeric trait. As can be seen with func void, if the compiler can't figure out which function to use, it will error out. The compiler will also error out if there's more than one specialization that could match. This behavior is very similar to normal function overloading. We can now make a start on our own two function. So here's the start to our basic two function. There's nothing really new here, except that it's easy to see the compiler's ability to infer template arguments. 
when we instantiate one of the two template specializations, you only need to specify what the two parameter is. You don't have to explicitly specify what one is because the compiler can figure it out for us. This is also known as inferring it. While converting primitive types like this is fine and dandy, we're going to want to also include arrays and structs. Let's start off with arrays, since we've already covered everything we need to implement them. This also allows me to introduce another component called expression decomposition. The main thing to note here is, notice we specify a from array, but we don't specify what from actually is. This is because the decompiler can still infer and decompose complex expressions like this, which is pretty awesome. An alternative signature could look something like this, where we use a constraint is array to enforce that from is an array, which would allow us to pass arrays, but the from parameter is now the array type, but the value type, since we don't decompose from into this value type. For example, it would be a string array instead of just string. Moving on, let's learn about a few more features before implementing struct into string. First up is static for each, which is a compile time for each that duplicates its body for every iteration. On the left, you see the original code. On the right, you see the unrolled version of the code. Notice that for the second for each, we use double brackets to create a new scope. This allows us to create variables for the whole conflict. This is because static for each does not create a new scope by default. This is very important. Benefits may not be immediately obvious yet, but it will be quite soon. Next up is underscore underscore traits, which I'll refer to as just traits. Traits is a special function that allows the compiler to inject special data into our code. In this example, we use the following traits. All members, which provides a tuple of strings representing all the members of a symbol. And get member, which given a string returns an alias. The member of a symbol has the same name as the given string. So for example, we have my struct with A and B as members. We give get member A or B alongside my struct, it will give us my structor A or my structor B. Use meta programming is essentially Lego. There are a bunch of building blocks that you can use to slot together to create something awesome. Here we combine static for each with traits or members, which allows us to enumerate over the types of a symbol at compile time and get as much information as we want about the symbols and its members. Next up are two very important components. Compile time function execution, otherwise known as CTFE, and string mixins. D is actually capable of running the majority of D code at compile time, which allows for complex computations to take place before the program is even fully compiled. We can use this feature for many purposes, such as pre calculating data to use at runtime. For example, it's very common to have lookup tables in certain programs. We usually use external tooling to generate a table or a D. You can just do that at compile time, all in the same language. D also has another feature called string mixins, where given a string of a valid D statement or declaration, that string will be included into the final compiled output. So if we combine CTFE and string mixins, we can generate a string or say an expensive array calculation and then mix in that string so we can access it at compile time and at runtime. You might even be using CTFE without knowing it, as there are many places where the compiler needs compile time name values, and thus will have to execute functions if you're using them. You can generate functions, entire classes or structs, or even entire modules, etc. So you may have thought that the previous example was a bit bulky, but in fact, CTFE is so powerful and useful we don't even need the string mixins in this case, we can just use normal looking decode. However, because gArray is a module scope variable, its initialization requires a compile time known value. So the iota.array part is actually being run fully at compile time, and then gArray is set or initialized for that result. 
This also means that Jira is a couple of times known to fail you itself, which means we can do even more shenanigans with it. CTFE is a brilliant feature which I highly encourage you to explore uses of. Now we know all we need to know to implement struct into string, and you may have noticed it's actually depressingly simple. Starting off, we have the function constraint, which we can check if something is struct by literally asking is type equal to struct. Then, put together everything else we've learned so far. We have static voyage plus all members to iterate over the names of each member in the struct. We have get member, get an alias to the actual member symbol, which then allows us to get more information from it. And finally, a string mixin to translate from member into things like from the A, from the B, etc. Now I need to think about how you would go about this in any other statically typed language and even dynamically typed ones really. Let's upgrade our struct into string specialization to allow the user to define their own to string function. While using static if, we can conditionally compile code based on any condition we could dream of. For example, we can use trace has member to see if the struct defines a to string member. I combine that with static if to decide whether to do our automatic stringification or to let the user define their own way of doing it, while still keeping the same interface. There's one problem, however. Traits as member only sees if there's a member or two string. It doesn't ensure there is a function that returns a string, which would be nice to ensure. That leads me to our next components, traits compiles and static asset. Static asset is a compile time asset that we can use to generate customized, user-friendly error messages. Traits compiles is a trait where we can test our piece of code or compile if we were to use it. Yet again, by combining these two features, we can enforce that the user's to string is actually a function that returns a string, instead of just like a weird member or to string. As an aside, when I learned about this myself, my mind was blown, and I was like, it is so freaking cool. Next up, I used the find attributes otherwise known as UDAs. UDAs are values, or even symbols, that are attached onto other symbols. UDAs can be pretty much anything, from primitive values, to struct instances, to bare symbols, etc. Let's upgrade our function again, this time allowing the user to specify via a UDA whether to ignore a certain value or not. We create the ignore struct, which we'll use as a UDA, we then attach the symbol of ignore, not the value, since we don't create an instance of it, onto one of the symbols. We can then check using UDA whether each member has the at ignore UDA. If they do, we don't output it. Otherwise, we do output it. So aka, we create a blacklist UDA. This is probably the most simple usage of UDAs. So let's flip things around and make a whitelist. We can change our logic around while we're at it as well. So we create the whitelist UDA and attach it onto a few things. And instead of iterating over member names, we now use get symbols by UDA to well, get all the member symbols and struct with the whitelist UDA attached. Now that we're by default going over aliases of the symbols, we need to extract the name of the member somehow, which we can do via the traits identifier trait. From there, the logic and the function is the same as before. So far we've only attached types as UDAs, so why don't we attach a value instead? At the moment, we use the value of the member for all the conversion into a string. But sometimes we might want a constant value that's predetermined. So we create the const value UDA and attach it onto something that we're actually constructing a value this time instead of attaching the type itself. Then using the good old static if plus has UDA combo, we can detect which symbols have any UDA. We then need to actually extract the UDA so that we can get the value. And for this purpose, we can use get UDAs. Note that you can attach the same UDA onto a symbol multiple times, hence why we are turned a tuple of values 
So a singular value. We then do a sanity check with static asset before indexing into the tuple to extract the UDA's value. Keep in mind this is all still happening at compile time. Wonderful freaks of magic. Let's do something a bit more advanced and ambitious and allow the user to provide a function as a template parameter is of a constant value. We can't use has UDA and get UDAs anymore since that would require the only concrete instantiation of const value, which we simply cannot know. So instead, we can use traits get attributes, get a tuple of all the attributes on each permanent symbol. This will give us both symbols and values. We can then use filter and a templated enum to filter down the tuple to only const value. Then finally, we can use static if to determine if the UDA exists or not. And if it does exist, then we can use the pre-computed value. There's a whole lot going on here. If you break it down, you'll see it's actually not that complicated. It's only really difficult because we're using a lot of deep specific features here. Finally, let's talk about duck typing. If it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then it must be a duck. Duck typing is a very useful feature when writing generic code, especially if you pair it with things like UFCS. Take the animal does speak line, for example. The compiler first sees if the syntax is correct, so can we call dot speak without any parameters? In other words, does it look like a duck? Then it sees if the call will actually compile, does it quack like a duck? And if both of these things pass, then compilation continues, because it must be a duck. Otherwise, compilation fails, because if you look at the cat duck, we have the speak function, but we also have a parameter that we don't specify in the do speak function. So when do speak tries to call the cat dot speak, it fails. So it must not, so it's not a duck, even though it might look like one. A nice simple feature with numerous use cases. So something we've been doing a lot of is design by introspection. With the ability to determine arbitrary traits about a given type, we can model our code in such a way that it mutates itself based on certain reflected traits. For example, on the left we have an animal rapid struct, which will change its own behaviour based on introspected information about a given animal type. So if we ask for the animal to speak in one language, and it specifies a member with the same name as the language, then we write out that translation. Otherwise, we write out that it has no greeting in that language. It's really hard to fit an example in such a tiny space, but you can do some pretty crazy and clever designs when you put all these different D features together. One common example would be serializers. Serializers in D can generate the complete code path ahead of time since so they can figure out all the things they need to do at compile time. Another example is STD dot experimental dot checked int where you can define an integer type different hooks to ensure things like there's no overflows you can even define if a program crashes on fail check there is an exception or prints a warning etc here's a variation of the previous example where we now generate a function for each permutation of language and animal the languages we need to generate a function for is figured out via introspection and a compile time executed function. So under the animal struct, there's the lang set static function, which we run at compile time. The functions themselves are generated based on a simple compile time for each plus traits check. So we go over the languages and then we go over each animal. Then we see if the animal has the language as a member. Thus we generate one version of the function, otherwise we generate a different version of the function. It's hard to express in such a short time and with such compressed examples. I hope you're able to start to see the opportunities designed by introspection can allow. Being able to mutate code based off of other code can allow design patterns you'd only ever see in dynamic jitted languages. Here's a more interesting example of DBI. A markdown parser who can dynamically construct a statically typed AST by performing introspection. So here at the top we have two structs which serve as the AST nodes 
then have our parsers, which define which AST nodes they produce, and so we can create a tag union ahead of time to represent our AST. We have a template called gather targets, which does some compile time magic to select all the targets members of our parsers, it then removes all the duplicates and then returns a couple of all these AST symbols we've defined. A bit hard to explain, but that's what it's doing. Furthermore, there's been a very interesting thread on the D forums lately about DBI, including a well written post by HSTO giving a good overview of what DBI is and how it can be helpful. I'll put a link to his post at the bottom for those who want to bother with it. That's one important thing to remember about metaprogramming in D. These features are not for free. The more templates you use, especially Phobos ones, and the more metaprogramming features you use, the more memory and CPU the compiler uses. You may start off with sub-second builds, but this can very quickly turn into several second builds. If you use dub, it doesn't help that dub itself is quite slow. And this is purely as a result of metaprogramming. In my experience, DMD tends to crash, as you know your non-swap memory limits, because for some reason it just doesn't use swap memory, which is a situation that template hell can put you in. LDC, on the other hand, only tends to crash. The OS cannot even allocate swap memory for it. Now then, moving on to example projects. We have example number one, called Pegged by Philip Siguard. This is a very popular library that, at compile time, passes a parsing expression grammar, known as a peg, and outputs D code that can be mixed in using a string mixin. Major benefits include no external tooling needed, you can just do it all in D. The peg tree is given a statically typed interface, and the generated native code can be optimised and inlined by the compiler. Yes, you technically know everything needed to implement your own version of PEG in terms of metaprogramming features. Example number two, and quite shamelessly, is JCLI by me. JCLI makes heavy use of metaprogramming features for several things, such as defining commands in a declarative way, declaring argument binders via UDAs, and automatic per module discovery of commands and arg binders. Example number three. Is 5.d by Sanka Ludwig plus over 150 contributors. 5.d has many uses on metaprogramming. One interesting usage is the ability to take one language, diet templates, and compile it into native D code. Diet templates are used to create HTML documents that can contain arbitrary D statements as a side effect of being able to import and mix in code at compile time. Another usage of 5D is the ability to automatically generate routes as long as your code follows a certain naming scheme. For example, get user string name turns into the HTTP get slash user query name blah. Example number four is std.experimental.allocator. This experimental package contains a lot of interesting usages of metaprogramming. For example, on the left, you can see that you can fluently com compose allocators with a single usable allocator. And since this is all happening at compile time, it's possible to keep the overheads of such designs to a minimum, allows the compilers to optimize, and so on. To end off, let's review what you've learned from this presentation. You've learned about 14 different components of these metaprogramming. You've seen examples of how they fit together, all the different pieces to make something awesome. You've seen glimpses into some of the more advanced things D allows you to achieve. Hopefully you've got a glimmer of inspiration for your journey in D. You've gained an appreciation for D-Man and you hope for a world domination. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. There's some contact information at the bottom if you want it. I've also linked my blog which has a tutorial on how to create a JSON serializer but just miscellaneous D stuff. Thank you. And have a one default day.